there was a question of culture uh, raised in the uh, morning session, uh, the importance of culture uh, and dialogue of civilization as a means to bring nations together. So our first speaker is Stephen Brower, the vice chairman of the BRICS. He will give us some of his insights on that question. Welcome. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, uh, diplomats and friends. Uh, I'm, the title of my presentation is uh, Towards a Community of Shared Future for Mankind, a Dialogue of Cultures Rather Than a Clash of Civilizations. Uh, the, uh, the question was, as my colleague said, was raised in the beginning of, uh, or in the discussion period around the importance of culture. And uh, I will try and address this uh, in my presentation. Uh, I'm going to reference to begin with uh, uh, a little bit of what this conference, which was mentioned by His Excellency, uh, on the dialogue of Asian civilizations. But before I do that, I'm going to begin and make some brief remarks. Uh, William Shakespeare, the world famous English playwright, uh, was or has been quoted as one saying, all the world is a stage. Now, <clears throat> the actual meaning of that uh, rather famous quote is not self-evident, as many people might believe that life is simply made up of staged entertainment or drama. Rather, it means that uh, in understanding world history, the destinies of societies are made up of power constellations, different naturally in the time of Shakespeare than our own right now. But around these types of power constellations, individual human beings have to make critical choices, decisions. And those de decisions define their character, in some cases, a moral character in other cases, uh, not, not so moral, in, in, in even immoral uh, decisions. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the decisions shape, those individual decisions shape the destiny of kingdoms or nations. And when such uh, individuals who have the ability to, to influence power fail to rise to the necessary intellectual or moral challenges specific to their own time in history, it is not only those individual fates of those people, those individuals, which end up in tragedy but the fate of the entire kingdom or the nation also goes down in tragedy. And as an example of that, you can think about the famous Shakespeare drama, Hamlet. Because Hamlet is led to know the dangers that are facing the kingdom, the kingdom of Denmark. But he, at every point that he knows that something needs to be done, with the knowledge that he has of the murder of his own father, instead of acting, he finds an excuse after an excuse for not doing it, for not acting. And that merely not alone causes the downfall of Hamlet himself, but in the end, if people read the drama of Shakespeare properly, it means the destruction of the entire kingdom of Denmark. And everybody dies. Now, the point is mankind as a whole has reached a similar type of turning point 
in world history right now, and as in Shakespeare's drama, Hamlet, the lives of not only a few individuals on, on stage are in danger, but the, the whole fate of humanity is going to depend upon questions and decisions that are made in the immediate future. These are real life and death decisions that I'm speaking about, not imaginary ones. And the greatest real crisis or challenge that has been facing mankind in this planet is the elimination of global poverty for all people and for all nations on the planet. That is the driving principle behind the BRI, a global elimination of poverty. And China has actually done, as our speakers have pointed out, a remarkable job of nearly eliminating poverty in China itself. And they're now reaching out to other uh, nations <clears throat> in other continents, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in South and Central America, and to Europe, to offer them the opportunity to achieve similar results for themselves if they wish to. No one is being forced to accept this type of cooperation. It's a free choice for those who wish to choose that. And in, in terms of achieving this objective of eliminating poverty. So, during the last 70 years, or 75 years since the end of, of World War II, the Western power structure has basically failed in even coming close to achieving this worldwide result of poverty elimination. Africa has not been lifted out of poverty. That's exactly what my colleague pointed out as to what the Belt and Road is about. But under 75 years, it has not happened. Many countries in Asia and other parts of the world have not been lifted out of poverty according to the power structure, decision power making of generally what has been policy making in the West. So now we have, as we say, 150 countries that uh, have become part of the BRI uh, and these Western constellations, instead of accepting and appreciating what China is offering, are tending to more or less say, how dare you do something which we ourselves have failed so miserably in doing and haven't been able to accomplish. So back to Shakespeare briefly and the power constellations that we have today, who would risk and cause potentially conflict and the world to go under rather than allowing the world to accept a new way of thinking, a new paradigm, which is implicit in what the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is about. It's based on a multipolar uh, world of sovereign nations cooperating for the general good of mankind. Rather than a unipolar world, which is based on a single power structure, enforcing its will and telling everyone else you have to do what we tell you to do. Now, I just mentioned that the Swedish government was invited to come here. Some people and diplomats have asked me why they're not here. Well, you're going to have to ask them. They were invited. They said, thank you, no. It's a clear decision that they're not interested in collaborating or even partaking in a discussion about what potentially the BRI means. That has to be taken up. It's, uh, it's a challenge. <clears throat> so this brings me to uh, the topic of what I'm speaking on briefly today, which is a dialogue of cultures rather than a clash of civilizations. So what we begin uh, briefly here is a quote from Xi Jinping's uh, discussion at 
the dialogue of Asian civilizations, which took place just a week ago. And uh, I printed out 50 copies of the speech, which I hope people have been able to pick and take, because I promise you, you're not going to see it in the Swedish press. And that should also be a discussion for some people is to ask, uh, like one of the representatives from parliament who told me when I spoke with her briefly, we have a free press in Sweden. Uh, well, that's a, a potentially a matter of debate. But they're censoring this. Uh, so I'm happy that I could at least provide that for people here. Maybe somebody can manage to convince one of the Swedish newspapers to translate and publish it so that it can reach more people. What uh, he says to begin is to meet our common challenges and create a better future uh, for all. We look to culture and civilization to play their role, which is as important as the role played by economy, science, and technology. That's, uh, the Conference on Dialogue of Asian Civilizations is convened for just the purpose of defining a platform for civilizations in Asia and beyond to engage in dialogue and exchanges on equal footing to facilitate mutual learning. That's the, the foundation for which every government, including the Swedish government, should be interested in participating. <clears throat> now, he also said we need to uphold the beauty of each civilization and the diversity of civilizations in the world. The aspiration for all that is beautiful is a common pursuit of humanity. Civilizations don't have to clash with each other. What is needed are eyes to see the beauty in all civilizations. Now that doesn't sound like a dictator, but the Swedish press tells you that he's a dictator. <clears throat> Diversity spurs interaction among civilizations. The thought that one's own race and civilization are superior and the inclination to remold or replace other civilizations is just ignorant. To act them out will only bring catastrophic <clears throat> Uh, consequences. <clears throat> now this is uh, uh, a quote that <clears throat> I think sets the tone for what I would almost call the beginning of what could be the Eurasian land bridge, which you've seen pictures of the Belt and Road and the concept of connectivity throughout the world. Uh, what, <clears throat> what Leibniz says, this is 1697, when he's writing to his friends uh, on the question of relations with China. This is quite an elaborate uh, work which points out the alliance between Confucian and Christian thinking, that they are not contradictory. And he says, I consider it a single plan of the fates of the, the human civil cultivation and refinement should be today, should today be consecrated as it were in the two extremes of our continent, in Europe and in China, which adorns the Orient as Europe does the opposite edge of the earth. Perhaps supreme providence has ordained such an arrangement so that it is most cultivated and distant peoples stretch out their arms to each other those in between may gradually be brought to a better way of life. It's the same, it's, it's the same concept. It's the, what the BRI is about. It's what uh, Xi Jinping is talking about. And this was 16, uh, 1697. Now, I, I include this because I don't think anybody here would have ever seen such a thing. This is a picture of a map by an American, it was a Civil War general, this is a map of 1890, but this map represents a policy uh, thinking that was going on directly after the 
American Civil War in con conjunction with uh, the, uh, after the assassination of, of, of Lincoln, in conjunction with uh, others who had a specific idea of a global perspective in which the United States would play a leading role in development. And as you see, he says, American economic just and correct map of the world, cosmopolitan railroads compacting and fusing together the world's continents. So I don't know if you can see it precisely, but all of these lines are basically what uh, my colleague was talking about here that are basic rail lines that are <clears throat> even going over the Bering Strait because the U.S. had been working directly with the Russians. The Russians actually supported the Union cause in the Civil War by sending ships to prevent the British and the French from entering onto the side of the Confederacy. And there you have the Bering Strait, which is the same point <clears throat> that's being discussed even today by Swedish company, Atlas Kalko, to build that in order to link up the continents. This was 1890. Uh, there's just a brief picture of the signing of the agreements that were made by, at that time, Secretary of State Seward and the Russian ambassador on the uh, sale of Alaska. <clears throat> this is a statement from uh, the, uh, William uh, Gilden, <clears throat> who is the man that drew this map. Uh, he was the governor of uh, Colorado before it became a state. But I think it's characteristic of when we had a speaker who spoke about we need a Kennedy. Well, I mean, look at the way that the thinking of this type of American represented. To disinfect ourselves <clears throat> of inane nepotism to Europe in other things as we have done in politics to ponder boldly on ourselves and our mission and develop an indigenous dignity to appreciate Asiatic sciences, commerce, and population. These are essential preparatory steps to which we must tone our minds. <clears throat> Be nice to hear uh, President Trump or somebody else in the American administration say that. There wouldn't be any, uh, I promise you, we wouldn't have a, a trade war right now. Now here you just see a similar uh, development, but this was a European development that was going on from uh, around 1890 to 1903. You had the uh, development of the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, which was actually completed in 1903. But <clears throat> that was not a, a project that was a simple matter of pushing through. The, uh, the, the uh, Chancellor of Germany, uh, Bismarck, was thrown out in 1890, removed because of this idea of unifying <clears throat> the Eurasian landmass through the development of railroads. The point that I'm, I'm showing this, and I'm showing the map of 1890, because these ideas are not completely new. These ideas have been there <clears throat> and represented an alternative for global development, for mankind, over 100 years ago. Well, what do you think happened? after eight, uh, 1903. Well, I'll show you. Here is a map of the British Empire. Uh, its territories demonstrate how at that time, the most important point for preserving British power in the form of economic control of raw materials and trade 
was controlling the choke, choke points, maritime choke points. Here you have uh, <coughs> the uh, South Africa, you have the Straits in Malacca, and you have uh, the Suez Canal, among others. And the point of the British Empire was, in order to continue to dominate and control 